Hey everyone and welcome to The Year Was, the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party causing all your friends to question, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? I'm your host Michael Montalvo and for the next few minutes we will swim through the river of time to try and find out what makes today truly unique. In this episode we examine the events that occurred June 15th. We could talk about a lot of things today, like how the year was 1844, and on this day, June 15th, Charles Goodyear received his patent for vulcanized rubber. Now, contrary to belief, Goodyear was not the first to cure rubber, but was the first American to do so. Probably. Actually, technically he's not, as it's widely believed that early Mesoamericans used similar techniques to create things like rubber balls around 1600 B.C., Goodyear discovered his technique in 1843 when he added sulfur to rubber, heated it, and noticed that it retained its elasticity. This vulcanization process not only strengthened the rubber, but also water and winterproofed it. This opened it up to markets such as elastic fabrics, rubber bands, erasers, balloons, shoes, hose, and tires. And hey, speaking of tires, you know the brand Goodyear Tires? Yeah, well, he really didn't have anything to do with it. He died 40 years before the company was founded. I could also talk about the world's oldest flag. In fact, the year was 1219. And on this day, June 15th, the Denimbrog, the flag of Denmark, was made, making it the oldest national flag in the world. I say made, but that's not entirely accurate, at least according to legend. As it turns out, in the early 13th century, Valdemar the Victorious led the Danish army into what is today known as Estonia on what is also today known as a crusade. However, while I'm sure that Valdemar thought he would face little difficulty in his religious crusade, the Danish army soon found themselves facing a strong army of the pagans they intended to convert at Lindenice, which is near modern-day Tallinn. Now, the Estonians put up a fight, and it was a pretty good fight, so much so that the Danish thought they would be overwhelmed and defeated. It was then that the bishop Anders Sunenson raised his arms to the sky and prayed for a miracle. And, as if a gift from God, a red lambskin banner bearing the symbol of a white cross descended from the sky in a way that only flags are capable of doing. Valdemar took the banner and, waving it, rejuvenated his army, and with the belief that God was on their side, they were able to turn the tides of battle, captured Lindenice, and converted many of its people to Christianity. That's the legend of it. According to historian Torben Jeskard Nielsen, what matters is that it's a good story. The mythological and religious elements only make it better. So does its old age. In reality, the flag had been used during numerous European crusades from the 11th to the 13th century. It only became the Danish flag in the mid-14th century, but most likely took its inspiration from the Holy Roman Emperor Louis IV of Bavaria. It was also used as a flag for Danish royals and was therefore banned for use by ordinary citizens for a time. This was during the 19th century until it was displayed to Danish soldiers returning from war. Today the flag is used more by the people than most other flags as there is no law to regulate the use of the flag, only guidelines, making it one that its people want to see being used in more and more ways. That's very interesting, I hear you say. And I agree, but I could also mention an interesting bit of medical trivia such as when the year was 1667. And on this day, June 15, the first direct blood transfusion to a human was performed by Jean-Baptiste Denis. Now, what's interesting here is that this was not the first blood transfusion. That would have been performed only a year earlier, in 1666, by Richard Lower in England, when he transfused the blood between two animals. But this story is about human blood transfusions, and the patient was an unnamed 15-year-old boy that I will henceforth call Jean-Luc. 
Jean-Luc had been sick, and so doctors did what doctors did at the time, and bled him in order to promote his health. Bloodletting a patient, for those unaware, basically meant that the doctor would open a vein with a lancet or a sharp piece of wood, and let the blood flow out of you. This was a result of the belief that all illnesses stemmed from an overabundance of blood. The problem in this was that Jean-Luc had been bled so much that he was now suffering from blood loss, and so with the knowledge that humans need blood to live, Denis decided that a blood transfusion would be the best course of action. The second problem here was that this was all experimental, and a fair amount of test animals had died in the quest to perform this procedure. Human-to-human -human transfusion was quickly ruled out, and the blood that was chosen was that of a sheep. In a Wired article written many years later, Tony Long summed up the whole procedure by simply saying that somehow the kid survived. Why somehow? Well, it should come as no surprise that human and sheep blood are not really compatible. Just look at all the different blood types that humans have and see that even we as humans are not all compatible for blood transfusions. Side note, the first human-to-human -human transfusion was performed September 26, 1818 in London. Unfortunately, the patient died after only three days. The most likely reason John Luke survived is that only 12 ounces of blood were taken from the lamb, which sounds to me both like a lot and a little, but what do I know? It was after the success of this transfusion that Denis tried it again to less fortunate results. The second patient did survive, but the third and fourth did not. He was actually accused of murder and brought before the court, but also cleared of any wrongdoing. Eventually, a ban was placed on blood transfusions, and according to Britannica, we now know that there would have been no way to perform a successful blood transfusion safely before the discovery of blood types by Carl Landsteiner in the early 1900s. What else can I tell you about this day, you ask? Well, have you ever heard of the name Henry Ossian Flipper? The year was 1877, and on this day, June 15th, Henry Ossian Flipper became the first African-American cadet to graduate from the United States Military Academy at West Point. Flipper was a soldier, engineer, and former slave who went on to earn the rank of second lieutenant after graduating West Point at 21. He was educated by the American Missionary Association and was one of the first to attend Atlanta University when it was established in 1869. By January of 1873, he wrote to James Freeman, a congressman from Georgia, requesting an appointment to West Point and received a response that it would be given on the condition that he proved himself worthy and qualified. After a series of letters, the nomination was given to him, and Flipper passed the admittance requirements and examinations, officially entering the academy July 1, 1873. And here he excelled. Even in the environment of almost total isolation, he received above-average marks, ranking 50th out of 76. He was assigned to one of the all-African-American regiments, which wasn't actually all-African-American as they were led by white officers, but still, he served with competency and distinction under the command of Nicholas M. Nolan when he himself led Buffalo Soldiers of the 10th Cavalry and during the Apache War. He would serve as quartermaster of the regiment and was put in charge of paying the wages of the soldiers and for mess supplies and general transactions. Things changed, however, when Colonel William Rufus Shafter took charge of the regiment and relieved Flipper of duty. It was soon discovered that Shafter had stolen $2,000 of the regiment's money and intended to blame Flipper for the theft and actually did so. Money was raised by fellow soldiers for defense and to pay back the money which was accepted by Shafter, but Flipper was still dishonorably discharged. After this setback, he worked in Latin America as an engineer, earning recognition and respect in not only this field, but in multiple different careers. He even worked as an assistant to the Secretary of the Interior before his death in 1940, having never once denied his innocence. But the story doesn't end here. In 1994, his descendants applied to the U.S. military to review the court-martial, and it was found that the punishment was unduly harsh and unjust. 
The dismissal was then changed to a good conduct discharge, and on February 19, 1999, then-President Bill Clinton posthumously pardoned Lt. Henry O. Flipper 118 years after his conviction. To round out today's episode, I thought we would look at one more event from history. The year was 1878, and on this day, June 15, the first moving pictures were caught on camera. The pictures were taken with 12 cameras, each only taking one photo, and were of a horse running. The purpose was to find out if all four of the horse's legs left the ground while running. What's particularly interesting in this story is that the whole thing came about as a wager from former California Governor Leland Stanford. The common belief at the time was that a horse always had one hoof on the ground, and since horses move so fast, it was impossible to tell with a naked eye. Stanford decided that the best way to determine and study this inquiry was to hire Edward Mybridge, the world-famous photographer, to take a series of photos to put the issue to rest. For his trouble, Mybridge was paid $25,000, but he wasn't sure that it could be accomplished. Still, he agreed to the job and set up a row of cameras with tripwires that would trigger a split-second photo of the horse as it ran by. The resulting photos did prove that all four hooves left the ground and settled the bet but also created the concept of motion pictures, resulting in the movies we all know and love. That's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the Year Was audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.